Welcome to Organic Week. I'm Kim DeLalo from the Canada Organic Trade Association, and we're so pleased that you're joining us this evening for um, a panel discussion with organic farmers, and it's moderated by the Canadian Organic Growers. So we're so happy that you're joining us um, because it's very important to learn about what comes from the land and how people are actually working the land. We let me introduce uh, the panel, uh, the moderator of the panel. And so Stuart Oak is our uh, panel uh, moderator tonight. And he is an organic farmer who alongside his wife and their business partner run a rooted, or, a rooted Oak Organic Farm in North Augusta, which is just north of Brockville. And they produce uh, certified organic vegetables and flowers for their CSA and farmers market uh, members. Stuart is also the current youth president of the National Farmers Union, and he is a strong supporter of organics or, or um, agroecology and the principles of food sovereignty, and uses his farm and position with the National Farmers Union to promote um, you know, eaters, farmers, and pol politicians alike uh, the message. So very pleased to welcome Stuart. And of course, we can't do this kind of uh, presentation without um, our sponsors. So we just want to thank our Organic Week sponsors. We have a wide range of different uh, folks from certifiers to brands to farms uh, and uh, distributors. For example, UNFI is a very large distributor across Canada who has a huge commitment to organic. Yorkshire Valley Farms, uh, ProCert, InnoFoods and La Cetra, which is a very large dairy. Uh, located in Quebec, but, uh, but works um, and uh, distributes their products across uh, Canada. So we just want to say thank you to the sponsors. I'm going to pass this over to uh, Stuart and uh, the COG team now, and uh, we look forward to a really excellent discussion uh, with our organic farmers. Thank you so much. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for that very warm welcome, Kim, and, and welcome to everybody who's joining us on this pre-recorded uh, virtual uh, webinar here entitled Transitioning Organic Perspectives from Canadian Organic Farmers. Uh, as Kim said, uh, my name is uh, Stuart Oak. I'm the current Vice President of Canadian Organic Growers and a co-owner of Rooted Oak Farm located, as Kim said, in North Augusta, Ontario. Uh, for those of you who uh, may be new or unfamiliar with uh, COG or Canadian Organic Growers, as we call it, uh, we're Canada's National Organic Farmer and Consumer Association. COG provides education, advocacy, leadership um, in order to help build an agricultural system that empowers farmers, consumers, enhances human health, builds community, mitigates climate change, all while increasing Canadian food sovereignty. So we've got plenty, plenty of things on our plate uh, that we work on on an annual basis. Uh, and on behalf of Canadian Organic Growers, I'd like to congratulate our partners, uh, Canada Organic Trade Association, during their 14th annual Organic Week. We're very excited to be part of the celebration again this year. I'd welcome you and invite you to check out uh, COG's social media channels at Canadian Organic to find our, our great Organic Week digital programming and giveaways that are happening uh, all week this week. Before we start today's uh, panel session, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that our conversation uh, and COG's offices are uh, being hosted and are located on the unceded and unsurrendered traditional territory of the Algonquin people. We honor the Algonquin people and their elders whose ancestors have occupied this territory since time immemorial and whose culture has nurtured and continues to nurture this land and its people. I'd also uh, like to thank COG sponsors, the Brian and Joanna Lawson Family Foundation for their generous support. In terms of today's panel, uh, we are joined here by three fantastic organic farmers from across the country. Our panelists have recently participated in one of three programs, either CODA's Organic Transition Fund, COG's National Organic Farmer Training uh, and Support Programs, which include Regenerative Organic Oats and our Growing Eastern Ontario Organically Program. Uh, in terms of those programs, uh, COG's Organic Transition Fund assists organic producers financially for their added costs while making that transition process to certified organic production. The uh, COG's Regenerative Organic Oat Program uh, which is funded by our industry partners at Nature's Path and Riverside Natural Food, is a first-of-its-kind farmer support program that will bolster the Canadian regenerative organic oat supply 
and supports prairie organic oak growers in adapting regenerative practices to meet the regenerative organic certification requirements. And finally, uh, COG's Growing Eastern Ontario Organically, or GEO, uh, program was a three-year Ontario Trillium Foundation supported initi initiative to help farmers transition to organic production. Over the course of that program, uh, GEO directly supported 57 farms representing over 10,000 acres uh, with mentorship, financial incentives, on-site experiential learning, uh, and more. While our GEO pilot program has ended, COG is working on its successor uh, uh, called the Transitioning Farmers to Regenerative Organic, which will regionally replicate GEO's successful model in other areas of the country. So with all of that housekeeping said, and all of the rigmarole done, let's jump into our panel discussion today. I've got, uh, as earlier I mentioned, we've got three fantastic farmers from across the country, uh, starting from east and working our way west. I'd first like to introduce Brendan Naima, Naima, Naima of Good Clean Farm located in Salmon River, Nova Scotia. Brendan was a participant in CODA's Organic Transition Fund. Um, he's also the owner and operator of Good Clean Farm, a small certified organic farm near Truro, Nova Scotia. Good Clean Farm attends the local farmer's market with fresh vegetables and a selection of ferments year round. And in the main season runs a CSA box program. Brendan started farming in 2014 in the Fraser Valley in British Columbia. He returned to his hometown and started cultivating his own farm in 2016. Uh, moving on to Andre Huell. Uh, of Farm Huel Farm located in Kieran, Ontario. Uh, Farm Huel Farm was a participant in COG's Growing Eastern Ontario Organically program. Andre is the third generation farming on their farmland and alongside his wife, Anik, and their three adult children. The last few decades have seen the farm shift its focus significantly from his grandparents' mixed dairy and potato farm to cash crop, crop operations with full-time off-farm employment to its present day Organic, ca organic cash crop with integrated livestock uh, form. Farm Hill Farm started using regenerative practices in 2018 as part of the transition to organic farming and certified organic last year for the first time. And finally, uh, last but not least, we are joined by Stacy Weeb of White Owl Farm, located near Sturgis, uh, Saskatchewan. White Owl Farm is a current participant in COG's Regenerative Organic Oats Program. White Owl Farm, owned and operated by Stacy Weeb and her partner Dale Mayer, is a mixed organic farming operation. Stacy and Dale have been farming for four years, where they raise uh, beef, uh, certified organic beef cattle, meat goats, as well as cereals and oil seeds. They share their 1,600 acres with all manner of wildlife. Uh, I want to thank all three of our, our panelists for being here today, and uh, excited to jump into our first question. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll throw this first question out to everybody um, and you can all uh, briefly share your reflections, perhaps starting with Andre. Um, what was the, the main catalyst or, or driving force behind your farm's decision to transition to organic or incorporate those regenerative farming principles? Why, why did you head in that direction? Well, I wish I wish I had a very nice reason, but for us, it was purely <laughs> financial. It wasn't yeah. uh, uh, originally the original intent was uh, the thought was even though I harvest maybe half the crop, I get almost nearly twice the price. Uh, no fertilizer and herbicide expenses. It was worth trying. Uh, I remember saying to the other farmers, "I'll try it, and if it doesn't work, I'll spray everything with Roundup and go back to my old ways." Well, that thought lasted about a month. I bought a few books from the COG bookstore, started looking at YouTube uh, videos, uh, organic farming, and uh, I stumbled upon guys like Gabe Brown, Ray Archuleta, Regeneration Canada. And it, there was an aha moment there where um, the, the complete system is based on soil health and not just a simple addition, subtraction of elements like fertilizer and stuff. This, so that's when I realized that it, the conventional model just wasn't working for me. Um, and best example I could come up with, my garden has always been organic, always grown, uh, provided for us and had much nicer soil than the clay ground I was cropping, which was getting harder and harder to work and needed more fertilizer. So, um, now that I am certified organic, I can't see myself going back. I mean, uh, it just, for me, it makes much more sense. So 
that's quickly my summary. Yeah, thanks, Andre. Um, uh, some 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 questions percolating in my mind, but we'll we'll circle back to those. Uh, uh, Stacy, how about you? Um, we're organic uh, because. Um, much like Andre mentioned, the whole farm, uh, whole system approach just seemed to make more sense than um, adding and subtracting because in nature you don't add and subtract, it all works together. So we thought, you know, like it just seemed to make sense to put everything together instead of having everything compartmentalized. It doesn't work that way. So why we're organic and the, the, the soil is important, is very important. And so that was one of the other reasons is that our, our soil is very different than even the person field right next to us who is not organic. So uh, that was important. And we wanted to leave a viable um, operation for our kids should they choose to take over. I didn't want to leave them something that was struggling or had made um, the environment sick. So that's why we're organic. Thanks, Stacey. And, and Brenda, what about you? Oh, uh, I, I learned how to farm at an organic farm. So that was always going to be the route. I guess um, when it came to certifying, though, I didn't have the, uh, well, money. <laughs> to do it and then um I didn't my farm was just pretty like run and gun for the first couple of years so once I finally kind of got it the infrastructure I needed to make it more efficient then I then I thought that it would be worthwhile to do the certification process um so that's when I started really when I had my feet beneath me I guess and, and Brendan, maybe we'll stick on you and we'll go back in a reverse order here. You know, in, in terms of the biggest, you know, barrier or hurdle for you within that transition, you recently gone through successfully that transition process. You know, what do you think was the biggest barrier or the, the most difficult part of that process for you? Um, and, and how did you overcome that? Uh, well, I hate to admit it, but it was the record keeping really. <laughs> I might have. I probably should have been doing it for years, but really like this motivates you to, to keep better records in it. Um, I mean, while it's the hardest thing, it was also maybe the most beneficial thing to my farm as well. So now, you know, third inspection in, I feel a lot better about the way I keep records and more confident going forward. Um, other than that, it would be just worrying about every little thing that might get the inspector to say, you know, where did you get that? Like <laughs> something that I would think would be obvious, um, maybe sometimes isn't as obvious or clear cut. So you have to be calling about, you know, if you want to introduce certain implements or even like the jiffy pots, like the peat pots was one issue I had in the yeah. last year. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that any farmer gets into farming because they love record keeping, at least not any of the ones that I know, but yeah. I, I know that we have certainly found on our farm over the years that the record keeping for organic certification has actually forced us to become better farmers because we're more, more aware of um, a lot of the inputs, but we're more uh, aware just from a business standpoint uh, where where things are going and and the cost of production has become a lot clearer and as we've gone through the process a number of times now we've adapted our records to be in line with the organic certification what they're asking for so now at this point you know they were somewhat harmonized and so we're not having to scramble at the last minute and reinvent the wheel every time the certifier is coming. Um, uh, Stacy, we'll move, we'll move back, uh, move back to you. What, what do you, what's been the most difficult part for your farm in, in making that transition? Um, weed management. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, um, challenging, uh, uh -huh. but I guess 
the positive thing is um, we're not the only organic farmers in the area who have issues with yeast, so it makes us feel okay that everybody else's organic field is uh, like the wheat mixed with, um, you know, Canada thistle. But <laughs> we're um, we're working on it. We're working on like um, introducing more cover crops and other ways to to deal with things that, you know, will help, I hope, in the long run. Less tillage, too. I mean, it's difficult <laughs> mm -hmm. to figure out how to get rid of those guys. So, yeah. Is I there any, I, is, is there any management strategy that, you know, you're most interested in or excited about looking at sort of getting, getting that weed management more in hand in the future? I mean, you mentioned cover cropping. Yeah, I think cover cropping is probably it because right now, for example, with Canada thistle, we're just using tillage. Like we just till it up in the fall and try and expose the Canada thistle and all of its many, many root bits and all those little babies that grow off those roots to, to <laughs> the cold. And so, of course, you know, you're tilling your soil and then, of course, that's not very helpful. So, like, so. I think cover cropping or maybe incorporating more forage into some of our rotations is where we're going with that mm -hmm. because neither of us want to be tilling in the fall because every time we till, I'm just like, oh, we're killing the dirt. So, <laughs> so yeah, we, we, we don't want to do that anymore. And one of, one of the things, um, before I uh, stop pestering you about this, um, I'm a weed management aficionado, so fascinated um, with it. But uh, one of the things I know when I talk to lots of prairie farmers about cover cropping is uh, they talk about the length of the season and how it's quite difficult to integrate cover crops in a meaningful way within a prairie uh, context uh, because of the, the shortened season compared to Ontario, for instance. Um, and I wonder what you what your experience has been in that regard. Yeah, I that's definitely a problem because um, our season is a hundred and what is it, maybe a hundred and twenty days tops. So I think yeah. we're going to we're looking at um, like inter intercropping. So if you put your cash crop down and put your cover crop in with your cash crop, and then your cover crop grows underneath and your cash crop comes up and you're still harvesting. But when that's like when your cash crop gets taken off, your cover crop is still sitting in the soil over the winter time. And then ideally I'd like to plant right into it, but that requires mm -hmm. um, some equipment upgrades that we aren't probably going to do right away. Um, mainly that would be like an air seeder that we don't have and they're not very cheap. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, so that's kind of where we're headed. Um, it's going to be a few year project, I think. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Stacey. And, and, and Andre, um, but back, back to you, what, what's been the most difficult part about your transition? I was. I thought. I thought it would have been weeds here too. But uh, we, like I said, we are luckier in a way that our growing season is a little longer, and we also have more options for um, for crop rotations. So we can play a little with uh, winter wheat, uh, harvest it a little earlier, and then get some cover cropping on that manages the weeds. So in that case, we're lucky and it didn't end up being weeds for us. It, we still have weedy fields, don't get me wrong, but that, our biggest, um, our hardest part for us was uh, finding a home for our products. Um, mm. it, it was um, uh, to get, to sell the grains, the transitional grains was something. Uh, we went from a, because of a lack of interest for infrastructure for us, we went from like a two or three year soybean to uh, one year corn rotation um, into uh, now we grow, we grow, we even grow cover crops for, for resale. So uh, we've got uh, maybe six different types of crops growing in one year. Um, and, uh, that has helped a lot on the weed side, but finding the buyers 
for that and for the meat that we we've grown um we can our customers that we have present customers have tell, keep telling us we have very good quality products that nobody knows about so the marketing side really hurts us that was the hardest part for us and and do you feel like there's is there a lack of um, you know, buyer, like grain buyers or uh, um, uh, close by? Uh, is it a question of distance or is it just a, a question of, you know, you're not finding the demand or you're, it's more about the connections and, and knowing who is looking for it? It's developing that network. When you start off, and that's that's where the GEO program was so helpful, uh, yeah. it's it's really developing the network where okay if i have this product i have these two three phone numbers i can call to get a price if they want the product um and that for me that was the biggest asset for geo for yeah program. well the 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 second sort of part of this question was you know what what do you see as um what's the biggest support that you see that's still missing from you know, your, in order from your farm and, and helping you to, to do better or said another way, you know, how, how could your farm be better supported and, and what can you envision in sort of a perfect world that would, would make your job easier? Um, for me, what would help the farm the most would be some sort of a organic valley uh, or um, an association where uh, you can take the marketing side away from me because I'm an okay farmer, but I'm a really bad marketer. So that's not my thing. And record keeping, well, I'm getting okay at it. But um, yeah, if, if there'd be something to, to help me develop the marketing, especially on the livestock side, the grain side is not a problem. And we use a lot of it in our feed for our livestock. So that's not too bad, but uh, it's really selling that pork chop or the chicken or, uh, we have customers that won't go all the way out to the country to go pick it up. And, you know, if they think about it, they'll go to the website and order it. But mm -hmm. um, it's, it, we're missing that little piece of infrastructure. Gotcha. And, and Stacy, as, and, uh, as a livestock producer as, as, as well, how, how does that, how does that resonate with you? Is any of that sound familiar to the context that you're in? Yeah. Yeah. We have a not very great, um, the infrastructure for organic beef is not as robust as say conventional beef would be. Um, we have customers that we direct sell to, but we don't have enough customers for the amount of um, beef that we produce. And there are a few organic finishers here, but they aren't always buying. Uh, so then a lot of our um, calves and yearlings are just going into the conventional market. Um, so that's not ideal. Um, we also would benefit, I think, from more local uh, inspected um, abattoirs. We've only got like a one nearby and, you know, he's the only one who's really, really busy. So, and I mean, that's good for him because, you know, He's making an, an income, but uh, it's difficult to schedule animals in, I guess. And so, yeah, the grain grain is okay. We usually have our crops contracted before we um, put them in. But yeah, the beef is is difficult. And I'm with Andre. I'm a I am a terrible marketer. Like I'm just. It, <laughs> It's not my it's not my strength like at all. Like I'll put me in with the cows, don't but please don't ask me to, you know, sell my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so if 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 yeah, I think I agree with him. That would be the thing that, you know, besides like a, a better organic infrastructure, just like uh, learning how to market better would probably benefit us. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that many farmers feel exactly the way that uh, that you do about the marketing side. I don't know that many farmers get into farming 
it, because they absolutely love marketing. Uh, they just happen to need to do it on the side. Brendan, you're uh, moving over to you. You're in a little bit of a different context uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, you're a direct marker, marketer and uh, a lot of what you do is marketing directly to, to customers. And, and how does all of this sit with you um, and, and does it sound familiar? Is marketing an issue for you? Where, where do you think you need more support in, in your operation? Um, yeah, well, like the market has always been fun for me and kind of like learning how to just put stuff out. It's just a customer service job, kind of, you know, and if people like your product, then it can be really enjoyable. Everyone's patting you on the back every week, telling you how beautiful everything is. That's that's nice. I mean, but the other side of that, I guess, is the extra stuff that I would like to probably get into restaurants or wholesale to grocery stores or something like that. But I, um, I find that difficult. Um, I've had various customers over the years um, that seem to come at opportune times, I guess. And But I've never been super proactive about getting that stuff out there probably because of the same thing that these guys say about it's just putting yourself out there you know I, I can grow the carrot I can put it on the table but as far as like going around asking people to buy it you know it's it's, it's that much more work um but as far as like support around here I think the most difficult thing is, for me is just implement like organic uh, compost like good compost source um and then just sources of just anything like from like alfalfa meal to just different products that i can put into my soil that are approved organically um i yeah. think that's the hardest thing to to manage in my area anyway yeah in in nova scotia specifically yeah yeah yeah, yeah uh, my compost comes from about two and a half hours away and then, okay. of course, the trucking was up this year. And then just to make it, it was 25% more. So it was that was a difficult expense for sure. Yeah, I, 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 our, our source of compost, which also gets bought in from off-farm, also went up by probably about that much this year as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. It's a necessary input, but uh, definitely uh, feel you feel those cost inputs in. Uh, it's not a great way to make up that money because it's not like you can just pass it directly onto the consumer or something like that. Yeah. Quarter at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one one carrot bunch at a time. Um, uh, Brendan, you did uh, you mentioned getting some positive feedback, uh, but I want to uh, ask a question of all of you. Uh, but w what's been the most rewarding or, or you know or positive outcome uh, from your transition to organic? Uh, for I guess the amount of people I get my town is kind of growing um so when people can, can just come to your stand and see organic on the labels and, and just know that everything's organic I think it makes a big difference I mean I've been at that market for four years and I feel like people didn't really know I was like grow my methods I guess but when you can just slap a label and say that it is it's a lot easier. I mean, it avoids the question of like, are you organic? And you answer, you know, I can't say, oh, I no. am, but <laughs> yeah, I, I practice these methods, you know, I can show you, <laughs> but it's with the certification, it's just a nice stamp of approval that, you know, no questions asked. This is what it is. Yeah, and 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 Stacy, uh, how about you? What's been the most rewarding part of this kind of process that you've underwent here? Um, the most rewarding. Uh, well, I like. I I think I agree with Brendan with the um, labeling aspect. Um, it's, yeah, it's just it's a uh, it's a standard that is there, and it's not. Um, like, like you can't argue with it, right? Like it's, it's like there's certain things that you have to do to get that certification. So then if people know, know the, like know sort of what that all encompasses, then 
you don't have to, like he said, try and explain what you do. Um, also, I think for us, just, um, I don't know, it just, it seems like uh, it just fit with our worldview better. And I think we feel like better uh, stewards, I guess, of the land because we're doing these things that are not so extractive. So yeah, I don't know, that one's hard to put into words, but it's, I don't know, you just feel, you feel good about going out and doing your job every morning, I guess is what it boils down to really. So yeah. that, that's what I like the best is just knowing that I'm not harming the fellow beings that I share my space with. Yeah, I think I think lots of organic farmers feel that way. And I, I, I've always said like the actual certification isn't for, you know, like your neighbors, you know, who can see how you're growing. The certification, I think, is a really important and valuable tool when we start to talk about scaling out the amount of organic production, because it's for everybody that you don't have the luxury of meeting and being able to talk to. It's for all the people that can can look at that that logo and that stamp and have faith that you know they understand the bare minimum of of what your firm is doing at the very least and and be able to scale out uh, and sell our products beyond their neighbors' borders and and to other people. So I think there's real value there. Um, uh, Andre, and, and how about you? What's been the most rewarding part for you? You mentioned a couple things earlier. I will echo what Stacy said. Uh, by far the most rewarding part for me has been the general feeling I get from uh, new wave farming. Uh, I've been at this for over 30 years and uh, conventional was becoming a chore. It was, uh, okay, what do I spray today? Uh, how do I do this? And it's changed to planning crop rotations years ahead. Uh, um, all the opportunities and the challenges involved and just the, the general feeling of working with livestock again and uh, uh, seeing how it all works together and then going into a field and uh, I, we don't plow that much anymore but because of weeds we still have to um, seeing turning over that dirt uh, that soil now uh, and seeing the difference in just the ease of plowing compared to what it was just five years ago um that's that's all it is it's just that general feeling that i know i'm doing something that i love to do and it's probably the better thing for for the environment i i i like brendan i worked when i i spent almost a decade working for other farmers all of whom were organic as well so it never really seemed like a question for me but i love i love this idea that you know couple decades into your your career you have significantly shifted how you're growing all of a sudden and that I, I imagine must have been a real intellectual like uh, leap uh, for you it's like oh, I, it's obviously not a completely different you know way of growing there's some similar tools and there's some similar processes but um, uh, can you can you share any more reflections about that sort of uh, you know, change in your in your mindset and what that's been like to sort of shift your your way about thinking about this these kinds of things. Oh, it was uh, like I said before. It was about a month in. Uh, it went from being skeptical about organics and and really seeing opportunities. And once you start seeing the opportunities and the and the challenges. And it just, it's just a complete shift in mindset. You're not thinking if I put one pound of nitrogen in, I should get one bushel of corn. You're not, it's not one of these things. You're, you're actually thinking, okay, now if this soil it doesn't have any, if it's dirt with no life, uh, it won't produce. Uh, if I don't, if I keep going with the, such a bad rotation uh, two or three years of soybeans and then one year of corn just because i have nowhere else to sell the stuff uh it, it destroyed uh it destroyed the land uh, our land wasn't growing we had to pump more fertilizer in we had to do um, it's the whole mindset 
shift into working with nature and trying to uh, foresee what could be coming. And then uh, the feeling you get, I can try 10 different things and fail at nine of them. And I normally do. But when I succeed at that one thing, it's worth all 10 tries. And that's what makes it so much fun. I, uh, it, it so often seems to me, you know, uh, we, at least within an organic production system, the soil is so much more than just like a medium for you to stick a plant, for you to then, you know, harvest the food on top of it. And all of you have spoken in, in various ways about the sort of ecosystem that's there. And, you know, I uh, certainly on the farm tried to adopt, uh, on our farm tried to adopt the adage of, you know, feeding the soil and, and, and not the crop and, and trying to build positive soil health that way. And a lot of things about organic production force you to think about that way. And, and I find it actually fairly intellectually stimulating doing a lot, what you were talking about, Andre, you know, thinking about crop rotations, you know, years in advance and, and, and then actually seeing it work is uh, very gratifying uh, to, for me. And, and that's one of the more rewarding things I, I find in, in my day to day. Um, so all of you sh shifting uh, shifting gears a little bit here. All, all of you, in, in one way or another, have participated in one of those three programs that I mentioned off the off the bat. And I wanted to chat a little bit about um, to all of the uh, about all of them. And I wonder whether all three of you could share some of your reflections about participating in that program and and what it what it meant for you and and uh, how how it helped your your farms find some some success. Uh, so maybe, uh, Andre, we're just speaking with you. Maybe we'll start with you and work back uh, in the opposite direction. OK. Um, the uh, GEO program that uh, Growing Eastern Ontario Organically, uh, yeah. I was involved in. Uh, I was one of the first participants. We actually decided to transition to organic maybe a couple of months before the program came out. So the timing was excellent for me. Um, I met with uh, Eric Berizar a few times. He was at the farm many times. The uh, Just the one advantage, uh, as I said before, when you're going into something new and you don't have that network of people built, um, when you get in contact with this type of program, there's not only the knowledge, there's not only the, uh, uh, the ability of the people uh, to point you to the right direction, there's also the whole network networking aspect where you find out what your organic neighbors are doing what products they can sell what uh, what they can help you with what you can help them with and the farmers every farmer i've met will bend over backwards to help somebody else but like me they'll never ask for help uh, I, I i'm I, you know i can do this i don't need the help and but this the geo program basically put everyone together, uh, offered uh, at the time because of COVID, offered um, uh, Zoom meetings uh, where they, you know, have the uh, buyer meet the farmer or, uh, you know, the whole networking aspect. Uh, and that really, really helped uh, in my case. That was a big advantage. Great. Thanks, Andre. And Stacey, you, you've been participating in the regenerative organic oat program that, that COG is, is trialing this year. And, and how's that process? Maybe you can explain a little bit about how you interact with that program and how it's been for you and, and what your experience has been. Um, it's been good. Um, I think we, well, um, we, uh, well, we, we're sort of, we were sort of a last minute addition. Um, uh, so we don't have as much, uh, like we didn't have last year um, with the sure. program just this year. So mm -hmm. right now it's been a, a lot of information. Um, but um, the thing I'm enjoying the most is um, probably talking about the soil. Uh, we actually got our soil actually tested through the program and um, just learning what's in it. Um, I don't know, for some reason, it's it's just really fascinating to me. I also mm -hmm. liked the program um, sort of, uh, like there were online meetings as well. Um, so it's nice to also uh, 
interact with people who are in the same program and see how they're going and understand um, the different levels of the uh, regenerative organic certification. Mm -hmm. So like we haven't certified our oats or anything yet. We didn't actually put any in this year. Um, yeah. So I think we're probably going to start um, with next year's crops. So I guess this year was kind of like an information gathering, getting to meet mm -hmm. other people who are doing the program, getting to meet the people who are doing the program. So um, we both felt like there's quite a bit of support there for it. And um, so it's probably something we would go ahead with. Like we had considered regenerative organic just in general, but hadn't really found a support network for it because it, you know, like it's not, it's sort of new. So there mm -hmm. wasn't a whole lot of people to talk to about it. So this way, you know, you can talk to people who have been in it for a while, understand what it's like and be like, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. We could do that too. <laughs> I know, I know it can be a pretty tough decision uh, for any farmer to do anything new because uh, there's always risk involved and in our jobs, I like to think, are about mitigating risk at the best of times. Um, uh, I wonder whether, Stacy, you could add anything about, you know, the, the regenerative organic oat program, you know, is, is funded by a couple of companies that we mentioned at the top uh, mm -hmm. that are consumers of, uh, of oats in large amounts um, and are looking to develop and, and help support more farmers growing uh, regenerative organic uh, certified oats. And uh, I, whether, I wonder whether you could add any comments about what it means to know that there are companies that are looking for this product. Does that make it easier for you to sort of take the risk on either the certification process or growing, uh, growing oats in a regenerative organic certified context? Or do you have anything to add on, on that? Yeah, it, I think it definitely helps um, to know that there's a buyer at the end of the season so that you're not because you're right. I mean, that was one of the big things that we thought, like, okay, so we put all this money into getting this other certification, but it's, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make a difference to us. It wouldn't have made a difference to our income without a company that was specifically looking for that certification, because it doesn't matter. I mean, if, yeah, so yes, long story short, yes, it's definitely helpful that somebody at the end <laughs> wants to buy my product. So that, yeah. that's a very big incentive for me to um, put the money in to get this other certification. Well, and I think it's uh, not that this uh, situation is like the, uh, the golden bullet for the difficulty of marketing, uh, but it is, I think, important for those companies that are looking for organic products or, uh, you know, try to adopt new certifications like the regenerative organic certification um, to, you know, put their money where their mouth is and not ask farmers to bear all the risk of trying something new, doing something different. And then at the end of the season, we got to look around for a place to sell it. So I think this is part of the solution to some of those marketing issues that maybe we were touching on earlier is trying to get, get those companies to, to ante up when, uh, when they want something or the consumers want something. So they need to be part uh, more actively of, of the mitigating that risk and helping us do that. Uh, Brendan, um, uh, how about you? What, what's, uh, you participated in CODA's Organic Transition Fund, and, and can you tell me, you know, you mentioned that the cost of certification was a barrier for you uh, in the past, and, and how did the support fund help with that? Yeah, I mean, I started transitioning without, before I even knew about the fund, actually, but there was sure. a newsletter from our, like, the Atlantic uh, Organic Regional Network, that mentioned it so we applied and got accepted and that was really nice because at that point I had paid two like annual fees I guess like the October and then like the renewal is always in April so you're like $1,600 deep at that point you still get <laughs> your food organic um but so to get that check was was really nice. It's a little simpler answer, but I mean, money's always nice to get in that context for sure. Yeah, I think sometimes it just comes down to dollars and cents, and there's nothing nothing wrong nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, 
I, I wonder, uh, we're kind of chasing uh, towards the end of our, our panel discussion, uh, but I wanted to leave space uh, for this conversation. Perhaps there's some people watching this recording thinking about making a transition to organic, maybe thinking about taking up organic farming from the beginning. Um, uh, whoever whoever happens to be listening, I wonder whether any, uh, all three of you have some advice to share uh, for farmers looking to uh, perhaps transition their farm to organic and either lessons learned for you or, or piece of wisdom that you would pass along uh, to yourself, maybe uh, if you were doing it all over again. And uh, maybe Brendan, we left off with you, so we'll have you start. Um, I, what I think, I guess, is leading up to leading up to applying to be organic, I found a lot of people would talk about how difficult it is or how much extra work it is and how expensive it is. Uh, and I guess those things are true, but I wouldn't let that kind of shy me away from it. Um, I think oh, an, another colleague of mine said that, like just what you said too, is how it kind of made them better farmers. So that kind of excited me in a way. Um, but I really don't think it's something to be intimidated by. I think like in the small vegetable side of things, that's if you grow 60 different crops or whatever, that's a lot to manage. But um, I just had my third inspection and it was a lot easier. And I, I look forward to my next one now because I, I think I've kind of got a handle on it, you know, as you start to get an idea. And um, yeah, so I think if you're thinking about it, you should just go for it, you know, and then hope Take that the there's plunge. a transition fund available to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 Stacy, uh, how, how about you? Any advice to uh, would be um, transitioners or uh, potential organic farmers? Um, my advice would be to find a network of like minded individuals. Uh, we're sort of it, we're sort of a, an island in a sea of conventional, and so it's difficult to um, sort of discuss things that you're doing that are completely not the same as your neighbors. So for us, finding people who were organic um, at, in our sort of geographical area or the same growing area was helpful for us to sort of bounce ideas off of or, you know, see what sorts of things they had tried um, as more seasoned farmers that worked and things that didn't. And so, yeah, that was important for us because we haven't been doing this very long. So we just sort of needed that um, little bit of extra mentorship. And, you know, it's always nice to have people to talk to and especially, you know, like everybody here lives pretty rurally, right? So we all know, like, we're all pretty isolated mm -hmm. already. And then when you're trying to do something new and it's a little bit stressful, that isolation isn't very helpful. So, um, yeah, definitely finding people to talk to for us was, was just as important as, you know, the actual transition certification process. Yeah. I, I think it's really hard to overstate how important those networks are, whether it's like mentor mentee relationship or just, you know, like a peer to peer relationship. I, I feel like 90% of what I know has, I've just learned through talking and working for other people. And, and even to this day, when I encounter a problem, I, there's, you know, like five or six people that I have on speed dial that I call to ask questions about, hey, what do you do about this or something like that. So. Uh, certainly, uh, more more of that is needed, and and those things, you know, it, it especially need to be regionally uh, based. Because obviously, you know, me talking to you and us trying to find commonality between how you know we run both of our businesses, me in Ontario growing vegetables, and you growing grains and oil seeds in in Saskatchewan, not a super similar context. And so, having those be regionally based is really critical. Um, and, and Andre, uh, how about you? Any any advice to your former self or or to to would be transitioners? I would echo what you just said. Um, you and Stacy have it pretty bang on the uh, the networking part. Uh, reach out, uh, talk to somebody that's gone through the transition. Um, like I said, 
every farmer I've met is just bend over to, to help anybody else. Um, the other thing I would suggest also is have a plan and periodically step back and objectively evaluate that plan. Uh, don't get, don't let your feelings get in the way just because you want to do something and it might not be the right thing to do at the time. Uh, it might not pan out on your farm, but there's a better thing in the works that'll, that'll work. Uh, if, if you're into uh, growing, for instance, buckwheat, but there are no buyers, uh, buckwheat might not be the way to grow. Um, there's uh, just evaluate, have that plan, make sure you can change the plan but really evaluate objectively uh, where you're at and if it's working. Uh, and and is there any and is there any tools uh, without uh, digging in too deep here? Is there any tools that you have found helpful to you in, in trying to do that sort of objective analysis around you know what's what's working or what's not or what might be a good idea or what not, might not? The the best the best tool is your bank ledger. If you're not making money at it, you might as well change because you won't be doing it too long. But uh, yeah. that's that's about the best tool. But it's the objectiveness of it. Uh, you be critical, but not too critical. Uh, try things. Don't, don't worry about trying things. Uh, it'll work out. That's the best advice I could give. Well, that, that feels like a nice, comfortable place to transition into some some conclusions here. Um, I uh, we wanted to, before I pass it back over to, to Kim to kind of uh, tie things off with the bow this evening, I just wanted to take a moment and thank all of our panelists, uh, Andre and Stacy um, and Brendan for uh, being with us tonight and having this uh, really fun conversation. Hopefully everybody watching uh, enjoyed us uh, hop around from uh, some, some really interesting organic uh, related content here. Appreciate everybody taking uh, taking the time uh, to attend and, and listen, and I hope everybody takes the time to participate in some of the other Organic Week activities uh, that are happening this week and, and tune into uh, uh, Cog's uh, social media, uh, like I mentioned off the top, and and to to Coda's uh, news feeds as uh, the week uh, rolls rolls on. So. Uh, with that said, and, and thank yous done, I will pass the uh, speaking baton back over to Kim, and uh, Kim, back to you. Yeah, thank you very much. What a fascinating session. I could certainly sit here for longer and hear you guys talk. I'm so inspired by people who actually put their hands in the soil and, and you know, our farmers. Uh, I have a number of friends who are farmers and it always is uh, truly inspirational. Uh, working for an organization like uh, CODA or uh, our very cherished COG. I mean, we do really important work to support and I'm very pleased to hear about the programming that has been supportive and, and it facilitates folks, um, you know, participation on the land. I love what some of you folks said, I mean, in terms of like-minded networks, evaluating the plan, a new way of farming. I love thinking about organic that way because I think organic is massively innovative. Uh, and uh, some of our other friends in the uh, agriculture world kind of own the word innovation, but I think that organic is challenging the boundaries and making new things happen and looking at things in a new way and bringing that new mindset. So thank you to everyone who's farming. And I actually do want to ask a question to Stuart. You've asked all these beautiful questions of this group. And just in a word, um, what are you finding most rewarding in your work? Uh, as a farmer, what are you finding that is really lighting your uh, way forward? Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, lots of the answers I heard resonated with me, but, uh, you know, I heard some comments about weed management and weed management is my own hobby horse, but I think when I really like when I make a plan and I really execute on the plan, it's starting to, I, I've been doing it just long enough now that I'm starting to feel like I have some experience. And when I'm able to execute the plan the way that I want, and I end up with like a weed free, you know, fall planting of, of carrots. And I'm looking at you, you, you thousands and thousands of feet of carrots in front of me, and we don't have to go in and weed them at all. It's like a, a special kind of accomplishment uh, that I feel, uh, and uh, brings me a lot of, of joy and like professional um, uh, gratification. So uh, that's that's my 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 recent reflection on on what I what I find rewarding. And it's it's easy to get 
bogged down into the like uh, grind of farming and and so reminding myself to pick my head up every once in a while and try to find those uh, those points of success because sometimes they're few and far between and 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 being able to celebrate those I think is something that probably most farmers uh, need to work on because it doesn't come naturally I think to many of us the uh, giving ourselves a pat on the back when we deserve it so absolutely absolutely um, thank you so much to everyone uh, Andre Stacy and Brendan for joining us and I just want to pop a slide up with uh, if there are any questions for people who are watching this presentation uh, you can certainly come uh, to our this is our sponsors and once again, this kind of thing is not available to us unless we do have the sponsorship and that is uh, just a reality and we thank them. But yes, if you have any questions, info at organicweek.ca. There's two really great websites, organicweek.ca or cementbio.ca, um, both uh, you know, fully bilingual and talk a lot about some of the cool things that are going. Uh, thank you, Stuart, for mentioning the other webinars. There's really cool contests and stuff in social media. And then there's uh, kind of a hub website called Choose Canada Organic. And um, we have a lot of resources there and building that out. And um, so that's kind of like a community space for, uh, for the consumer facing work that our organizations do. So it's wonderful to be in partnership with COG tonight on this uh, webinar and, uh, and on the other work that we do together. So that I think is the, the message of organic is we work together, we have a larger purpose, we um, set aside any kind of like challenges and we just say, what is what are we trying to achieve? So um, I thank you all very, very much for joining us this evening. And so for that, then we'll wrap up. So um, wishing you all a very good evening and uh, please enjoy Organic Week, September 12th to 18th. and. Uh, we look forward to the next time we can talk. All the best.